shrinking in the corner, pressed into the wall. Do they know I'm present? Am I here at all? Really poignant quote from Lang Mead. Have you ever felt so insignificant? You felt you were barely visible. I certainly have. And I want to take you back to many years ago when I was a little girl growing up in Glasgow, born into a very strict Baptist family, I had two older brothers and our life very much revolved around the church and the church community. We were actively encouraged to spend our leisure time with friends from the church. And while my parents were very caring, our upbringing was quite narrow, both socially and culturally. When I was 12, my parents were invited to start a Baptist church in Castlemilk, a really deprived area of Glasgow. And so they started services in a school hall until they could build the congregation up and a church could be built. And after a few months, my brothers and I decided to reach out to the teenagers in Castlemilk and to start a youth group on a Sunday evening in the same school hall. And we attracted teenagers from all walks of life, but most of them from really troubled backgrounds. Many of them had been in and out of prison. Most of them were addicted to drugs or alcohol or both. Most of them carried weapons and most of them were in gangs and not only carried weapons, but also the scars to prove the fights that they've been in. And yet this tough crowd welcomed the opportunity to come into a warm school hall on a Sunday night and to be able to talk to people who weren't judging them. And at 13, I was standing on this big stage in this school hall talking to these troubled teens about life and hope and purpose and fulfillment. Fast forward a couple of years and the hormones are raging and I'm starting to feel increasingly isolated at school and I'm dreading Monday mornings because my friends are all talking about what they did at the weekend the films they watched at the cinema, the disco they went to, the boys they danced with, who they kissed. And I couldn't join in because I wasn't allowed to do any of those things. And it started this voice in my head, this little mantra, which said, you've got nothing to say. And that can still rear its ugly head even today. And so I rebelled and after weeks of persuasion, I got grudging permission to go to this den of iniquity, as my parents called it, the disco. I went along once and then a second time. And then on my third visit, the inevitable happened. I was swept off my feet by a handsome, charismatic, very worldly wise guy. And I fell madly in love. And over the next few years, my formative years, he had a massive influence on me. He knew so much about the world and world affairs and politics and the media that we never discussed at home. And I learned so much from him, so much so that a lot of his opinions and points of view became my opinions and points of view. At 19, I married him and very quickly realised I'd married a bully. Not a physical bully, but an emotional one. Now I was his wife, he wanted to mould me into the perfect wife, with the perfect home. And on the rare occasion we entertained the best dinner parties. I had to agree with his points of view. And on occasion where I'd raise my head above the par parapet and disagree or voice an opinion of my own, particularly in company, I would be shouted down. And then at home, 
there would be tirades of abuse. He would say really cruel things. You've got no opinions of your own. How dare you go against my opinion? Our friends don't want to hear what you've got to say. They come out with us because of me, my charisma. You've got nothing to offer. You've got nothing to say, that mantra again. And at first I used to fight against this marital straitjacket, but I soon realized it was easier to play it small because very often we'd go through days, weeks of silence. And I used to dread hearing his key in the lock. I can still feel the knot in my stomach when I think about it. And so I shrank and I shrank into a shadow of my former self. And when I was in that really, really dark place, deeply unhappy and really unfulfilled, the overriding emotion was shame because I looked back on that young girl of 13 on that school hall, talking about life and purpose and fulfillment. And here was I living a life that was barely significant in any way. What would those teenagers think of me now? And I know now it was fear that kept me in that place because he made me believe that I couldn't survive without him that we were meant to be together, that I would fail on my own. And the more he told me, the more I believed it. And so despite the fact I left several times, I kept being drawn back into that web. And you know, the brain doesn't know when we feel fear, whether it's a wild animal racing towards us or whether we're just scared that we're going to stand up and do a presentation. And it's the same response. It's the adrenaline, the stress levels, the heart rate racing, the dry mouth, the sweaty palms. And the brain will give us every reason to stay in our comfort zone when we're trying to take action to move on in our lives. My acronym for fear is feel, emotion and rise. Because I don't believe we should just ignore fear. I don't believe we should stuff it down and just try and walk through it. It's got to go somewhere and it will manifest itself in your body or in your emotions. So recognise when you're being scared. And unless it's a life threatening situation, welcome that fear because it means that you're being stretched, that you're being asked to grow. And when you realise that, you're much more likely to take those steps that will take you out of your comfort zone, into your stretch zone and into greater fulfilment in your life. There's a wonderful quote by Nick Williams. He says, when you walk through your fear, you become inoculated against it. And on the other side of your fear is a whole new sense of freedom. And I love that word inoculated. It means that fear is never going to paralyze you again. Each time you take that action is going to be easier and easier. A few years ago, I saw a quote by Oprah Winfrey that changed the course of my life. And she said, don't worry about being successful, work towards becoming significant and the success will naturally follow. It stopped me in my tracks because I'd been brought up to work towards success, work hard at school, get good grades, go into further education, get better grades there, get a good job and stick with it because that will guarantee you success and security in your future life. Why on earth was Oprah now telling me not to worry about success? So I did a bit of research. I talked to quite a lot of people and I found out most of them had the same answers, that they very much measured success in terms of material wealth, both in themselves and others. So it was the kind of house they were living in, the car they drove, the amount of money they had in the bank 
how well their business was doing, where they could afford to go on holiday. And there's nothing wrong with all those things, by the way. But when we measure our life in terms of material wealth, we quite often find that it's unfulfilling and material things are incredibly addictive. The more we have, the more we tend to want. And very few of us on our deathbed will talk about the house we lived in or the cars we drove. Most of us will want to know that actually we've made a real and lasting difference in the world, that we've had a positive impact on the people we've shared our lives with, both at home and at work. So how can we become more significant? Well, one thing that made a massive difference to me back in 2012 was being gifted a profile test, an online questionnaire, which then delivered a comprehensive report highlighting my strengths, my challenges, my ideal roles, my communication style. And I came out as a star profile which means that I add most value when I'm delivering one to many, exactly what I'm doing right now. But having that level of confidence from that profile meant that I was ready to stretch because I was already doing a lot of training and developing people, but I knew I had more to give. And getting that concrete evidence of where I'm most in flow and where I add most value gave me the confidence to stretch and to join the Professional Speaking Association. Now that might not sound very scary to you, but when I went to suss this association out, I was bowled over by the level of speaking that I witnessed. And I honestly thought, gosh, I thought I could speak. This is a whole different level. And then guess what? you've got nothing to say, reared its ugly head. I thought, what on earth can I possibly say that's going to interest these highly accomplished speakers who travel the world with audiences of thousands? However, I believe in being scared regularly, so I did stretch and I did join, and I did go through this scary experience of putting myself on the stage to speak and be critiqued by my fellow speakers. And bit by bit by bit, my speaking career has grown and my confidence has grown. So I'm so glad that I stretched out of my comfort zone in that instance. So where do you think you are most in flow? Flow is when you're doing the work you are put on this planet to do. You're playing to your God-given strengths. It's not about doing stuff you quite like or you're quite good at. It's when you're so aligned with the task in hand that time flies, you're in the zone and you consistently deliver at a really high standard. And the magic is when you're in flow, you spark up your creativity. And so many people go through life thinking they're not creative. Pablo Picasso famously said, we're all born artists. The challenge is to remain an artist while you're growing up. Because creativity is often squashed out of us during our formative years, when we're told again and again and again to do things the way we've been told. Oh, and that's the way we always do it here. And then we might move into a company and come up with some ideas and be shouted down, told that they will never work. And so we settle back into that belief that we're just not creative. But when you're in flow, doing the work you are put on this planet to do, you see ideas, you find ways around obstacles and challenges, and you keep growing in your area of expertise, and you become known as the go-to person in your field. And then you can support and advise and inspire others to step up. And that's being truly significant. And you're not threatened by the rising talent around you because you're so secure in your own value that you're really happy to support them to equally evolve and grow. And that creates a culture of engagement 
and collaboration where everybody feels valued. The other aspect of significance I want to touch on today is being fully present. And very few of us are ever fully present because our brains are so taken up with the endless demands on our time and attention. And so many of us live with regrets of things we didn't do yesterday, that endless to-do list that we didn't complete. Or we beat ourselves up because we didn't spend more time with our kids when they were younger or more time with our parents before they passed on. And yet we cannot change one iota of something that happened a nanosecond ago. So why do we devote so much brain space to regrets? Let it go. Learn from your mistakes, but let them go. But at the other end of the spectrum, so many people are waiting for that utopia. You know, that perfect time in the future when you've got your ideal home, your perfect partner, you've reached your ideal weight, you're financially secure and everything in the garden is rosy. And I hate to say it, but that time might never come because none of us know how many tomorrows we have. The only time we can be absolutely sure of is right now. And the problem with dwelling in the past or always looking to the future is the bit between becomes a corridor and we're racing along and we miss the magic of every day. And yet, when we're fully present, life is so much easier. We just play full out wherever we are and we notice things we wouldn't otherwise notice, like hearing the birds singing in the morning, hearing nuances in conversation, noticing a change in the mood and emotions of those around us. And when we're with people, we give them the gift of undiluted listening, listening to understand, not listening to speak. And people feel heard and valued and appreciated. And that essence of you and the way you made them feel will stay in their minds for long, long after you've left the room. And that's been truly significant. So where are you right now? Are you shrinking in the corner, pressed into the wall? Do they know you're present? Are you here at all? Or are you standing tall, strong, courageous, fearless, knowing exactly the unique value that you have to offer and letting that show in a way that the people that need you most can find you? Are you living your legacy right now? Making a real impact in the lives of the people that you live and work with and leaving your indelible footprint on the sands of time forevermore. So don't worry about being successful. Work towards becoming significant and this success will naturally follow. Thank you.